All right, hi. Um, wow, pretty huge. Anyway, um, so I'm Sebastian, and I've got the uh, presentation stuff, the code, the demo, whatever, uh, all up in uh, my GitLab repository, uh, if you are interested in that. So I'll be talking about Babel, and it's not a very long talk, but um, just to give you an idea, um, I'm going to talk about how to make Babel plugins, generally. So uh, talk a little bit about what Babel is, sort of how what compilers are. I kind of learned a little bit about that, uh, different stages. Uh, and then we're going to code a couple of demos, see what we can do with these things, right? And then I'll, maybe I'll show like what I've been doing with that beyond that. OK, so let's we'll start. Um, so we can use uh, Babel to do code mods, which is like modifying code. Um, so you kind of like take code and turn it into other code, right? It's a little bit meta. Uh, I didn't know anything about compilers. I've never done computer science or anything like that, uh, just like the guy who created Babel. Uh, he's also called Sebastian, so we've got two things in common. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's this awesome project called Babel, which I'm sure everyone knows about, nothing new. Uh, everyone uses it to transpile their you know, beautiful ES6 code into stuff that actually runs on the platforms that we're targeting, right? So if you're not familiar with Babel, you know, um, it basically takes future code that is supposed to work and turns into code that currently works in like ancient systems, like state-of-the-art browsers and V8 and stuff like that. Now, um, the, the basics of Babel is like, is like any other compiler, in that it takes code and turns it into what's called an AST, an abstract syntax tree, right? That's just like a weird theory thing. Um, you then transform your AST to a different AST, right? Who knows what that means? And then it generates the AST into code again or into a source map. So there's the three general stages. Each of these is very modular. Uh, with Babel, you can actually modify through plugins what happens at the parse stage, the transform stage, and the generates generation stage. Um, I'm actually going to talk about mainly the uh, stuff that we can do with plugins at the transformation stage. That's what everyone really does. There's a little bit about the parsing that I'll go into, because uh, it's kind of interesting to see how it works. And you could also extend that if you want to. So the parsing takes uh, the source code, turns into tokens, right? So, so then turns those tokens into a tree of nodes, right? So the output is that AST. So it takes code and turns it into AST. The two stages are that it takes, uh, well, it's called Babylon. So it takes, uh, does this lexical analysis to turn the source code into tokens. So basically, think of, like in English, there would be, you take a sentence and you take every word and you sort of mark it as a word, right? Without any meaning. So it just like chops it into different words. That's kind of what, it, what the source code does. It takes every little chunk of the code and turns it into a chunk, and it says that this is a chunk. That's about it. It's very, very simple. It's like a flat list of you know, chunks of code. The second stage that it does to turn it into an, an, an actually meaningful tree, uh, the ASD, then it's where it's going to figure out, like, oh, this is actually an assignment, or this is an operator, and there's like two operands. And it'll figure out sort of what the code means. And then it gives you that as a nice tree. And so we can see what that kind of looks like with this awesome tool called AST Explorer. Um, if I got Wi-Fi, let's see if we can load that. Mm. It's basically uh, like a DOM for your code. So here's a generic example where we see a little bit of code on the left-hand side, and then we see the automatically generated AST. So if you're using um, ASTs, you'll find that there's lots of different parsers. And the one that we're talking about is Babylon, specifically version 6. That's the latest one with, uh, with, with Babel. So the Babylon 6 parser is uh, you know, slightly different. They're all going to be they're going to be more or less the same, but you'll see a bunch of information here that sort of describes the source code that you're looking at. So the, 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 um, the top level, you know, that would be like your HTML, your, you know, your document or something, right? In, uh, in AST, that's going to be a file. And then you step into your program, and inside your program, you've got all the different you know, parts of, uh, of, your, of your code. Now, just for clarity, we can turn off like empty keys and location data just to collapse. You know, basically, you don't need to know like, what character of the source code we started at. But here we can see the code on the left-hand side. And when you click on it, any part is very nice. It'll take you to the exact node in the tree that that represents. So in this case, these, this little this string here is a string literal node. Every node has a type, and that's it. So beyond the type, it depends on what type it is. Right? So, so think, of the, um, think of them as different classes, and they all extend from this node you know, base class, and this has a type. And then, like for example, a string literal will have a value and maybe a raw value and things like that tucked away. You don't, but you, you generally don't need the, these other ones when you're transforming the tree anyway. So 
this is a, a nice little tool, ASD Explorer. If you're playing with Babel you know, plugins and stuff like that, this is definitely going to come in handy. Um, but you can see how, for example, you know, different parts work. So you, you zoom out a little bit, you see like, there's a call expression, on the, and it's like highlighted on the left-hand side. There's a member expression. The member expression has done two you know, properties, an object and a pro uh, an object uh, identifier here, this console, and then another identifier log, and things like that. You, it's very intuitive. If, and if you're familiar with you know, web, Right, of course, you can use similar APIs to like a DOM to traverse the node, to, uh, to traverse the tree, to create nodes, to remove, replace, and manipulate them. And that's, that's the API that Babel really gives you, or, and Babylon actually gives you. Um, and then a bunch of helpers on top of that. So let's see what we can do with that. Okay, in the, uh, so that was all the, the, the uh, basically the parsing to turn it into this tree, and then this is what we get. So the next stage is gonna be that we transform it, where, like I said, we're gonna you know, do stuff with the code, right? So you can imagine that, um, there's lots of things that we may do, and I'll show some examples, to take our you know, input source, manipulate it a little bit using these APIs, and then end up with a different tree. And the reason why you want to do that is because in the next stage, it'll go and generate you know, the output source code and the output source maps. So you don't want to deal with that you know, manually. It would be incredibly tricky string, string manipulation, right? So you want to deal with just a tree. It takes another tree, and then it generates a source map. You know, it'll generate the output, things like that. So all right, let's, show, let's see what we can do with that. So the first thing, uh, I'm going to sort of introduce a little bit of basic concepts as well as the uh, libraries that make up the Babel sort of ecosystem. Uh, Babel is actually like one giant repository. It's a mono repository. To manage it, they actually made a tool to manage mono, re mono, mono repositories. If you deal with it on GitHub, it's pretty overwhelming because all the issues with all of these subprojects are in the same repository. Um, all the source code is all in one giant repository, except for Babylon, which is somehow is slightly separate. Um, Anyway, so Babel Traverse is the first one, and that's basically going to be how we, you know, think of it like a jQuery, right? You're, you're kind of like running through our query selector, like you're just running through uh, the entire tree and picking things off that you want to deal with. You don't want to deal with the entire tree. It's just going to give you little subtrees, like little branches off the tree that you can then work with. And um, here's a little example where we just log for like, um, for every, uh, what do we look at? We're looking for string literals, okay? And we're going to log whenever we, found, whenever we find a string. So the code goes very simple. Um, you import you know, the transform function from Babel Core, and you pass it a little bit of code as a string. Right? So you can imagine reading from a file, passing it into transform. And then the, um, the second argument is going to be basically your Babel RC file. So if you're familiar with Babel, you're familiar with the Babel RC file, we specify the presets and the plugins that you want to use. Right? Now, in the, you know, if you're calling it from the API, you can just stick in the, um, uh, the JSON uh, representation of that, and you can do something else, which is the plugins. There's typically an array of little strings. You can stick in a an object here that has this visitor property, and the visitor property is going to be a function that is named, or is going to be a fun function that's named after the type of node that you want to, you know, work with. So there's lots of there's like you know dozens, hundreds of these uh, different types of nodes, and you would specify you know which one you want to deal with, and then get a callback every time that is encountered in the tree. So you kind of like fire and forget. Okay, you just give this to uh, Babel, and it'll call you back and say, "Hey, I found a string literal, or I found a member expression, or I found a this or that." And you then you then work with it, manipulate the the the, um, the tree, and then it, you know hands off again, and then it continues on within Babel. So you can give it tons and tons of these uh, plugins, and that's effectively how the presets work. So if you if you do a preset like you know ES twenty seventeen or latest or something or a React. It's basically just loading like 10 or 20 plugins. And each one does like a tiniest little thing. A lot of them are just a few lines long. And they're very, very uh, powerful that way. One caveat is that you don't really control the order of execution. So it could be that one plugin uh, modifies something that you're expecting, but it only does it as a, at a later stage by hooking into a different type and then modifying it. Right? So you, you kind of end up with a little bit of issues that I, in, in my work I had to work around with by running the Babel transformation multiple times with different um, you know, sort of delicately ba uh, set up structured um, sequences of plugins or sequences of presets. So be aware of that. But anyway, let's see what we can do if we actually run this. Let's see, I have a terminal here. Oh, wonderful, how convenient. So, demos, okay. So if we just run this now, I'm gonna run this with Babel node so that I don't have to transpile separately. Uh, what is this one? Hmm. Traverse. Yeah, there we go. So this one here, um, it is going to log three times that it found a string. 
And that's sort of what we expected. We have three strings here. So no, notice that it, this, this, this is um, the source code right here. And it has a string literal, a string literal, and another string literal. So it doesn't execute anything. It doesn't like combine these and do all clever things with it. It'll really figure out exactly what in the tree each of these things are and, and call back. And it will just log, OK, we found three strings here. And um, you know, this is very, very you know, basic stuff. But what could we actually do with this, right? And um, what we could do with this visitor, right, with, the, um, with the, the nodes that we're dealing with in our plugin. So we can make a very simple linter. So here's like a, what a 10 lines or so, and this is a JavaScript linter, right? It's not a very useful one, but it's technically a linter. So let's say that we uh, run this code. Ooh. What's it going to do? It's going to take this different piece of input source code. So we have a var foo equals 1 to 3, and var bar equals 4, 5, 6. And this is an uppercase foo, and I don't like that in my code. If I have a variable that's not a class definition, I don't want it to start with an uppercase variable. So I have a little plugin that I can create here for every variable declarator. I'm going to inspect its name and check the first character, and then see if it is an uppercase character, and then give you a warning. So I'm, I could run this in my NPM test and always get a <coughs> warning when, when something like this slips into my code. Right, so I could run this, and very simply, um, using this plugin, I can say, OK, now I'm going to pick out that this variable foo begins with an uppercase letter. So it's a very, very simple way to start creating useful things for yourself. Right? And this is effectively what things like you know, um, standard or ESLint, this is sort of how they work. They all use one parser or another to generate an AST, and then have a lot of these little rules that just scan through the tree and issue warnings, and then have a little warning reporting system, and you know, that, that's your linter, basically. Right? This is sort of how they all work. So this is very easy to um, build these kind of things. Um, another thing is going to be the uh, Babel types library. Uh, this gives you validators and builders, which are kind of like very useful little helper functions to uh, inspect nodes in the tree in a very clean way. So you don't have to look at the, the type property and compare it to some list that you have or something. You can just go, you know, types dot is a string literal, and then you give it a node, and maybe you can pass it some options, like does it actually contain uh, this property to be equal to that. Um, you can also create your own uh, types this way. You can create your own nodes that way. So if you're generating new, you know, like if, again, the analogy to the DOM would be you, create a, you do a new uh, element, you create a new element. Uh, this would be creating a new node with the types uh, library. Um, this, this is also the reference for uh, figuring out what types there are in Babel, because there's loads, and it gets really tricky sometimes um, to figure out exactly what you need. A lot of types also can be used interchangeably. So uh, they might all be an expression, even if it's a member expression. right? So if something is expecting an, an expression, you, know, you have to make sure that it sort of matches. But um, so yeah, this is a very useful link if you in, get into this stuff. Um, then uh, a use case of this, for example, like what do we do with all these types and these builders and these um, validators, right? We could build a, a, a little transpiler, right? So we can take one form of code that contains an alert, and let's say that we don't like alerts, we just want to automatically turn all the alerts in our source code into console logs to not you know, annoy the user, right? This is a simple way to do that. We can have a little plugin that, notice how now it's no longer just an object, it's actually a callback function. When, you're when you specify a callback function, it, it feeds in the types, so you don't have to import it yourself. So we get the types as t, and we check all the call expressions, which is like a function getting invoked, right? Uh, and you just you know you check like is the um, w whether the callee property. So basically, how you, how you figure out what the path and all these nodes and all that stuff. You just take some source code, drop it into AST Explorer, and click around and say, okay, oh, I'm looking at the node dot callee. Then you pass it in, and oh, it needs to be an identifier. Oh, and it needs to have a name called alert. So you kind of like. The way I work with this stuff is really just look at the different you know, um, references, the different documentations, and then use the XT Explorer and sort of like click, click, click until you get it, and then you, okay, you're done. Uh, it's a little bit insane to keep all these things in your head, so this is a very uh, you know trial and error kind of approach. But anyway, I just you know you would look at um, the call and say if it matches the uh, if it's an identifier and it has a name of alert. So if we found a function being called that's called alert, then we're going to replace the path. Uh, callee with a member expression, and the member expression has, is console.log. Right? So that's sort of how you, how you specify that in, to generate a new node in the ASD and then replace an existing node with that node. Right? So this is a very simple way to do that. Let's see if it runs. And uh, I don't know what it's called. 
Minify, Traverse, Limiter, Builder. Wait, I don't know which one of this is. Excuse me. Yeah, this one here, okay. All right, so it changed my alert hello world into a console.log hello world. So the output source code, I can now write that to a file and feed it to my browser. So this could be a build step to transpile stuff. So this is a mini Babel um, transpilation plugin. So I don't know, this is not the most useful thing as little you know, examples like this, but you, know, you add all these things up and it becomes super, super useful. Um, lastly, uh, another kind of important concept in the Babel's uh, Babel context, I'm guessing this is the same everywhere for other uh, compilers, um, is scopes. So with scopes, it helps you figure out uh, whether like, variables are going to be uh, clashing with the variables in another context. So this is normally a very complicated thing in JavaScript or any language, really. And it takes care of that completely. So you can simply rename a variable. So I can rename food to bar. Uh, I, give in a, I, I give in var foo equals one to three, and it'll rename it var bar at one to three. Or I can generate... I can generate uh, variable names, um, uh, like basically making sure, that, uh, guaranteeing that they're not going to collide with anything else. Um, a, an, a use case for this would be to minify things. So if you have something with very long um, variable names, I can rename them to something very short. So I'm not going to bother running this. Basically, uh, this is how minifiers also work. They kind of figure out you know, variable names that can be removed because they're not exposed beyond the scope of a function that's being uh, you know, like a private variable, basically. Uh, you can collapse all these names to something that means the same thing. Anyway, so the uh, most important um, reference is by this man, James Kyle, who's going to be at the conference, right? Uh, Babel plugin handbook, fantastic resource. Also, there's a Babel handbook, but this part especially I love. It is a very nice guide. You know, you read this for an, an hour or two, and you know how to make plugins, you know, at a basic level. It's very nice. Um, definitely check it out. So... A little bit about what I've been working on. Oops, one second. Um, so I've built a couple of interesting plugins, I think. Uh, one is it, it takes, um, it sort of resolves the paths of modules that you're importing. So if you're importing, um, say, a named module from your node modules folder, it'll trace exactly where, lo where it's located relative to the source file and replace that, substitute the path. Okay, again, like on its own, it means nothing, but you combine it with some, some other stuff uh, for example, this one I'm, I'm also using to turn uh, var foo, you know, require, you know, common JS style. I'm turning that into ES 2015 modules, right? So you see where this is going. I'm kind of transpiling modules from common JS and mapping them to relative paths to each other rather than name dependencies. And I've kind of combined these and a couple of other plugins into a tool which I can now use to take... Um, uh, the stuff that you would do with Webpack or Browserify to bundle things, I can now transpile all of my files, including my node modules folders, um, and turn them into individual JavaScript files that I can serve up on a web server that's using, for example, HTTP2. If you were here at a previous talk that I gave, uh, I'm, very big, I'm a very big fan of HTTP2 server push. So I can serve up rather, than, rather uh, instead of a m one big bundled file, I can serve up you know, 300 small files and get the benefits of caching and things like that. So combining a couple of Babel plugins let me build that uh, relatively easy you know, over a couple of weeks of uh, my free time. And I thought that was you know, kind of interesting. So I might talk more about this at another time. Um, probably at JSConf for a little bit. Probably all of it. OK, so I'm Sebastian, and that was my talk. Thank you. Is there, is there any time for questions? No. Uh, we have uh, a little bit of time for questions, if anyone has questions. Is anybody using Babel for other languages than JavaScript? React, JSX, um, you know, Flow. There's, there's lots of extensions to the language. There's a flexible concept. But I think fundamentally, it's not set up to really become like an, HTTP, uh, an HTML transpiler or a CSS transpiler or something like that. Like there's still some parts within like Babylon that would make it really hard to do that, I think. But maybe somebody pushes it in that direction. I don't know. It'd be interesting. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Cool. So we're not yet at the end of the talk.
Andy, uh, talking about algorithms. 